There's a lot of confusion about the gospel and Christianity. What exactly is the gospel? What does it mean to be a Christian? Is salvation just a ticket to heaven, or is it so much more? All of this and more with my special guest, author and associate professor of theology at Quincy University, Dr. Matthew Bates. Matt, I hope you don't mind me calling you that. It is good to have you here on the show today. Hey, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm excited hey. to be here. Cool. Well, we've got a lot to talk about today, some things that may be uh, debated, and that's okay. But before we get into the, the topic of the day, I would love to for our listeners to know just a little bit more about you and your background. So if you don't mind, take a couple minutes and uh, let us know who you are. Well, we all have our own journey, don't we? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, my story is... Um, one that's probably not too unusual for people who grew up in an evangelical or quasi-evangelical kind of culture. Um, mm. I uh, remember from some of my very earliest days, maybe even my very first memory, you know, praying to accept Jesus into my heart. Mm. At least that's how the matter was framed to me by my mother. Um, so I, I grew up in a Christian household, um, but we weren't very um, devout in the sense of just attending church. It was very mm. a, a very private, pietistic kind of um, background. Mm. Um, and um, through a series of events, we ended up eventually going to a church. It was a fundamentalist, King James only kind of church um, that um, was on the one hand, like full of the love of Jesus. And I really um, met uh, the Lord there in a whole new ways. But mm. on the other hand, there was some goofiness and some, some probably some intellectual problems. There, there was a, maybe a slightly anti-intellectual culture to all mm. of that that um, raised questions for me too. So uh, as my journey went on, uh, it was really when I was in college that I took a New Testament class. And I realized that even though I, I had probably a superior knowledge uh, going into the class in comparison to most of my fellow students, partly because I was emphasized in my background, hey, we, we need to read the Bible. We need to take it seriously. Hmm. Um, but I realized I had no idea how to really read it, right? That I, I knew a lot of scripture, but there was some sort of fundamental interpretive framework that, um, that I had sort of missed out on um, as I really didn't... Um, have any sense other than a kind of a proof text here and a proof text there hmm. uh, for how to put scripture together. Um, so that awakened me and it helped me realize I needed to clean up some sin issues in my life and also um, kind of launched me on a spiritual quest uh, to, hmm. to, to recognize that in scripture, right, this is where I, I have my most um, uh, weighty intellectual, spiritual, um, everything. Th there's a rich appetite there uh, hmm. to, to try to learn everything. Right. That's that's part of scripture. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, from there went on to a uh, seminary at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, and uh, did um, a master's level work in scripture. And then I did Ph.D. work at Notre Dame. Um, so that mm -hmm. was interesting to kind of move from a, a Protestant to a Catholic environment uh, mm -hmm. for doing Ph.D. work. Um, there was a lot of Protestants there studying at Notre Dame, too. Um, so, um, in fact, my doctoral supervisor was Protestant. Mm -hmm. So um, but nevertheless, an overarching Catholic context that made for a very rich experience. Experience. So that's a little bit about my journey. Wow. Well, I think probably your journey uh, probably hit a few notes with a few people, you know, because I mean, my actually background somewhat similar in that you know, I went to an evangelical church and at age four, you know, heard, heard a gospel message and, you know, was asked, you know, do you want to receive Jesus into your heart? And I'm like, well, why wouldn't I? I mean, if, if I die and my mom's in heaven, I want to be with my mom. I don't want to be in hell. So, you know, ask Jesus into my heart. But, but as I grew up to grew up to be an adult, and began to really wrestle with my faith and what it meant to be a follower of Christ, I realized something's <laughs> something's amiss with that approach to salvation. And so that's really what we want to talk about today. Uh, today we want to talk about your book, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. Uh, and how I came to, to acquire this book is I was serving with a, a, a pastor here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we had a lot of great discussion about what salvation really meant. Uh, how does a person get saved and what's the outflow of it? And he goes, you got to read this book. I think this is the, the, the answer you've been looking for. And so let's just start talking about your book, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. I'm curious, what's the book about for our listeners? And also, why did you write this book? Well, the book is about, um, on the one hand, that we we need to think carefully about the gospel, and it could be that we are missing um, dimensions of the gospel as it's expressed in the Bible, and I would say in a widespread way, missing um, at least key emphases. Hmm. And on the other hand, um, that might be connected to a misunderstanding of what faith is. So that that obviously connects to the purpose in writing the book, right? right. As um, as it was to address those 
deficiencies that I saw um, largely in, you know, Protestant evangelical culture that I was familiar with. That's my background. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but also as, as that broadened out a sense of like, actually there's, there's some problems um, that are significant across the board here, at least in how we're speaking about salvation. Um, So the book emerged from those two concerns and also, you know, of course, scholarly um, work that I was doing at the same time too. Right. Hmm. Well, in your book, Salvation by Allegiance Alone, uh, you offer a definition of pistis that is different than what many of us have been taught, whether in seminary or just in a Bible study or in Sunday school. Uh, We typically translate the word pistis as faith or belief, but in your book, you offer a different definition. Talk about how you came to discover that, and, and how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I think actually the bell first got rung for me in that direction when I was reading um, a, a book by N.T. Wright, and this was actually right when I was starting seminary at Regent College, um, as we actually got to choose a, a number of books off a list to read, and that one was of interest to me. I thought, well, the challenge of Jesus, I want to be challenged by Jesus. Hmm. So I, I'd heard I'd heard of N.T. Wright and heard that it was he was good and interesting, so I, I snagged that book as, as one of the required books hmm. uh, that I was going to do a little report on. Um, and so in reading that, one of the things that Wright mentions is that there's actually a a moment in Josephus, uh, who's a Jewish historian from the time of Jesus, who's he's involved in a war with the Romans, and he's a Jewish general. And um, there's a moment where he has to call some of his um, his um, subordinates to um, to kind of realign their loyalty. And he uses pistis language. Hmm. Um, He uses the adjectival form of pistis um, and summoning them to repent and to believe in him. And it was interesting because that's so close to, to what Jesus, you know, is calling his followers to do. And Wright points out this parallel, right? And so that kind of, uh, I just pondered that, right? And then, um, you know, as I was doing my Greek training um, and then going on to do, it, to do doctoral work, um, I, I increasingly re- recognized how often in the New Testament that faith can and should be translated faithfulness or loyalty, mm-hmm. um, especially when we're talking about like the community response to um, to King Jesus. Um, you know that when Paul commends uh, you know various churches for their um, their pistis, mm-hmm. right? He, he has in view probably their fidelity or their loyalty, um, mm-hmm. not necessarily their trust or their belief. Mm-hmm. And um, seeing how many how often that's the case in the New Testament made me think about the broader language. And maybe um, there's more slippage between the idea of faith in and faithfulness too. Mm-hmm. Um, and that got me thinking. Wow. Well, it, I mean, when I came up. Upon this, I thought, man, I, I don't remember ever like seeing this range of meaning, and so I mean, no doubt that took you down a path that that was very eye-opening for you and challenging. Um, but talk a little more about this idea of allegiance compared to just faith, because I, I don't know if many of us have wrestled with that. But but dig a little bit deeper. Help us understand why that matters. Yeah, so uh, one possible meaning then of pistis is loyalty or allegiance. Um, mm-hmm. And this is something that is is common knowledge among experts in biblical studies. I don't think that point would be disputed by anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, it's interesting because as um, you know, biblical scholarship developed, right, that there, um, there was tension within the Protestant world over, you know, faith and works and not wanting to uh, mix those up or slide those together. Right. And so that I think pressured the the community to a translation of the word pistis that would exclude those kinds of loyalty or allegiance ideas. Um, but certainly we see that um, that's uh, those ideas are present. Now, what it foregrounds, of course, is um, that there's a difference between giving your loyalty or allegiance to a king rather than just trusting in the promises of God. Ah, mm-hmm. So that would be the the kind of the real payoff, right, would be that traditional um, theological constructions following from Luther on down, right, in the Protestant world have tended to say, like, what does God want from you? God really wants you to trust his promises and that they're true in Jesus, that Jesus has died for your sins and that you're forgiven. And that if you trust that to be true and you believe it uh, in some kind of effective sense, right, um, well, then you're saved. Right. Um, And so... uh, the the claim is that um, maybe we need to think through that language of belief a little more carefully and to bring in the loyalty nuance more, and that might help resolve some of the tension um, in classic um, in classic theo- theology around faith and works. 
Got it. Got it. Well, in your book, you talk about the gospel and, and you have a very robust uh, outline of it. Talk a little bit about that, because so often, I mean, I think our minds are kind of messed up when it comes to the gospel. I mean, I've got three young boys, uh, ages 12 down to eight, and they've heard the gospel. I mean, we've talked about the gospel. And it's funny, I can ask them, hey, what's the gospel? And they go, um, Jesus loves me. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's really yeah. embarrassing. It's like, oh, no, I failed yeah. as, a, as a father and a theologian. So talk about how you uh, unpack uh, the gospel in your book. Well, Nat, I, I don't think you've failed as a father or a theologian. I think we <laughs> could ask a lot of a lot of pastors and missionaries that same question. What is the gospel? And um, the reality is, is we start to fumble like when we get to it. I mean, on the one hand, we we kind of know it and we feel like we know it in an intuitive sense. Right. But then mm -hmm. whenever we start to press into the exact details, a lot of us fumble. I've done that exercise a lot in teaching this material, like huh. take one minute and, and write down what the gospel is. Right. right. And um, it's interesting to see what people produce. Hmm. Um, so. Yeah, um, whenever we pay careful attention to the gospel and scripture, I think one of the things that we discover is that it's bigger than we thought it was, mm -hmm. um, but it's not as big as all creation. It's not just the story of creation and new cre creation. But on the other hand, it might maybe has a different climax than we think mm. it does. Mm. And it's bringing those two together. Um, uh, I think those two insights together that really helps us to rethink the gospel in a more biblical way. So typically, the typical understanding of the gospel would be that it's centered on the cross and that it's mm. about Jesus dying for our sins. Mm. And uh, and then maybe also his resurrection that might get thrown into. And the center of energy tends to fall there on that right. point, that Jesus right. died for our sins. That's really the that's the really important part to get to with regard to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Actually, whenever we look at a, I think, a more robust um, biblical definition of the word euangelion, and we kind of explore that in the New Testament, and we, we look at it, it's, um, it's the, the places where that word euangelion gospel is clearly given content um, we see that it's a little wider than that um, that it in fact begins with the father sending the son to take on human flesh hmm. um, so the incarnation we would want to see as part of the gospel too and of course like if you would ask any christian is the incarnation important um, they would say yes Absolutely. is it gospel yeah. um, they might be like I don't know, right? Mm. Um, I think I think actually when we look at um, the word euangelion in the New Testament and we explore places where the gospel is preached, we would see that it is part of the mm. gospel. Mm -hmm. So the Son sends the Father to take on human flesh, and he does so in fulfillment of the promises um, that, that God made to David. Mm. Right? There's, there seems to be a focus on that, um, and that, um, that as Jesus then lives uh, out the human life, having been born into the line of David, mm -hmm. uh, he, of course, dies for our sins. And that's a, that is a fulfillment of Old Testament patterns and prophecies. Right? That's according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He's buried. He's raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. But we don't we often stop the gospel there. And I mm -hmm. think that's the problem is that that's actually not where the gospel stops. So when we pay attention to it, um, that beyond that, Jesus is witnessed. Right? right. Like people see him raised from the dead. And then. And the, the, actual, the, the actual most energy in terms of how the New Testament talks about the gospel is on the next part, that Jesus has been enthroned at the right hand of God, that he's been made Lord and Christ. Right. So we often just use the name Jesus Christ, and we don't really think very much about it. But the Christ is an honorific title. It means the king. Yes. Right. And so the whole framework of the gospel, the whole packaging, right, whenever Paul talks about Jesus, you know, um, having died for our sins, uh, having been buried, having been raised from the thir uh, from the dead on the third day. Right. When he talks about all that, he actually doesn't use the word Jesus. He uses the word the Christ. The Christ mm. is the one who has done this. Mm. But we slide right by that. Right. And we don't think about how this is all a story about a king who's now enthroned. Right. Um, so once we recognize that the high point of the gospel or the climactic energy lands on Jesus as he is now ruling as king, that helps us to rethink what it means to respond to the king. It helps us to rethink about what faith might mean in relationship to this king. Maybe it means something more like allegiance. Hmm. Wow. Well, you're listening to the Hard Questions, Real Answers podcast from Back to the Bible. And joining me today is author and associate professor of theology at Quincy University, Matthew Bates. And here we are talking with you, Matt, and it's all about your book, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. And again, this is a thought-provoking book, and it's honestly really challenging because it makes us rethink what it means to believe and what are the implications of our salvation. And one of the things you just talked about is Christ's kingship. And that's something I'm convinced most evangelical Christians never consider. I, I think more and more, I hope we're talking more about his lordship, uh, but not so much about that kingship. And, and I love that picture of King 
Jesus. Um, so talk about that a little bit more. Why is that and so important? And is there a difference between lordship and kingship? Yeah. Um, well, I think that, I mean, if we want to get technical, right, it's Jesus the Christ. And so um, we have to kind of unpack what it means to be the Messiah. Of course, mm -hmm. um, this is nothing new to Christian theology. Everyone recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. Right. Um, the problem is that sometimes that gets um, kind of packaged as an extraneous thing beyond the gospel, mm -hmm. as if, um, or his lordship does, like that, okay, the gospel is Jesus died for your sins. Oh, and he's the Lord too. Right. That's like an extra factoid <laughs> outside the gospel or beyond the gospel. Or maybe it's in the gospel and like people might say, like, okay, you need to like confess Jesus as Lord too. Mm -hmm. And there's a recognition, but oftentimes that's that's inadequately interfaced with the whole scheme of salvation, mm -hmm. right? As people then are like asking questions, well, if you have to submit to him as Lord, doesn't that mean you have to like do something with your life? And doesn't that then implicate us into works? Mm -hmm. um, how does this avoid um, like violence? Violating grace, and you begin to get all these kinds of um, kind of difficult theological questions that that are are part of that. Um, when we realize that Jesus's kingship is integral to the gospel, right. um, then, then we we begin to do better. So the Messiah idea um, is the idea of a Jewish style universal king. So they were mm -hmm. anticipating a king, right, who would be king over Israel, but that he would have universal significance because the nations would come to him in order to be informed by him, and the law would go forth from Zion in some way, right. And so th there would be a sense that he had beyond Israel significance. So we're justified in seeing this as um, language that uh, that it would be equivalent to kingly language i think hmm. in our in our context um, is that different from lord um well i think lord um has more of a honorific valence in the sense of like um somebody who's important um someone who has power in some more circumscribed way some more hmm. limited way uh kingly language uh, has a, a valence of greater authority and of um, uh, of the buck stops there, hmm. um, where a lord might have a lord over top of him, right? It's um, it's a little bit more ambiguous language. I like kingly language better, partly for that reason. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense, and I, I guess that part might be one of the reasons why I used it more than just lord. Uh, maybe it was just I, maybe by chance. I don't know, uh, but I. It says in it, in Romans 1, 17, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Mm. Um, and so it, it talks about the gospel being something that the, that reveals the righteousness of God, which okay. possibly could be understood as justification. There's debate around all that. But certainly Martin Luther understood it understood it to, uh, to be a statement of our justification. And I think that he's probably right there. Mm -hmm. um, so, but... It's different to say that the gospel reveals justification than it is to say that it is justification, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, if I was to give you a, a let, let's say I was to throw you a party, okay, and I was to give you a gift, and let's say I was to give you a watch, right? Um, it would be a mistake to say that the watch is the party or something like one is the event, right? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the other is a benefit that you got okay. at the party. It's kind of different, right? Um, and we don't want to confuse the two. So the best way to speak about the relationship between the gospel and justification would be to say that justification is a benefit that derives from the gospel, but is not part of the gospel. Hmm. Our justification then is something that we receive whenever we respond to the gospel. So it's conditioned on the gospel. It's conditioned on an acknowledgement that Jesus is king, 
But if we start putting it within the gospel, the problem is that it becomes an object of gospel scrutiny and affirmation hmm. in a way that it wasn't intended to be. And it makes the doctrine function in strange ways for the church. So it's better to talk about justification then as a benefit we receive from the gospel, and faith is actually the response to the gospel. Huh. So neither is actually part of the gospel technically. They're both very closely related to it. Um, uh, faith or allegiance or faithfulness or fidelity, right, mm -hmm. is the proper response to the gospel. Right. The justification of benefit we receive from the gospel. Well, that, that brings a lot of clarity. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not the only person who maybe have gotten a little stuck on that, so that's really encouraging. Um, well, you, you brought up the righteousness of God. I want to ask one more question about some of the content of the book, and then we're going to move into more of the so what, the application. Okay. But um, in your book, you talk about the order of salvation, and, and in that you define the righteousness of God. So it, how do you, according to your book, define the righteousness of God, and how does that agree or disagree with a Reformed perspective? Yeah, um, that's a that's a kind of an exacting question. I'd have to look up my <laughs> quote, to be honest, uh, to remember yeah. exactly how I defined it. And I forget um, what page it's on. But um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I uh, didn't, don't even have my book in hand right now. Um, but it's essentially um, the righteousness of God is um, is Jesus, uh, like would, would essentially be God's declaration over Jesus as Jesus bears the wrath of God, right? right. That Jesus is indeed innocent. Right. Uh, so it's as Jesus makes atonement, right, that Jesus is indeed the innocent one, and that so are all who are who are participants in him. So hmm. uh, it identifies Jesus, uh, the Christ, as the one who has been justified, right. and that then um, what follows from that is that all who are in him are too. Um, so I think that we can find room for seeing righteousness of God as a status that we as believers do hold. Luther was right on that point. Right. Um, I don't think it, I don't think we should reduce it to the covenant faithfulness of God as uh, has been done by some scholars. So um, how that relates to traditional reformed ideas um, this gets into some pretty technical um, discussion, um, and the, it's, there, there's sort of two avenues w w by which we could go to talk about this. One would be to talk about the traditional Reformed order of salvation. Mm -hmm. The other would be to talk about imputed righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's at least let's talk first about the the, the order of salvation within Reformed theology. Mm. So Reformed theology would argue that at the heart of the the logical order by which God saves us is first of all that God justifies us, which is seen as a process of transfer into his community, mm -hmm. okay, that we become part of the uh, people of God so that we are uh, innocent in God's presence. Like in, in, in God's eyes, we have a, a status of, of, of righteousness. Mm -hmm. All right, but then after that, then uh, God then begins to sanctify us. And that's considered logically after, not necessarily chronologically after within mm -hmm. Reformed theology, they both flow from Christ. OK, as John Calvin articulated that. Um, and then we then move to glorification. We, we eventually then attain a status of glory a, as that process unfolds. Right. Um, so that would be the, the traditional order of salvation. Um, I, I would I would be hesitant to see justification language as uh, the process of entering kind of language. I do. Mm. I think it's more positional language. I think it's language about who is within the covenant community, not um, language of transfer into the covenant community. Um, so I would have some hesitation about how some of that is nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, if we flip it over to the other side of the question, and again, this is a little bit more technical, a little bit sure. more advanced, um, I would want to be careful with language of imputed righteousness. Um, scripture doesn't say righteousness is imputed to us, um, mm. using the word legizomai in Greek. Um, it speaks a little bit differently about righteousness. It's, it says... Um, uh, with regard to, um, for instance, um, we, we can talk about uh, righteousness in, in other kinds of language that would be closer to Scripture. I, I would prefer something like in the Christ righteousness or incorporated righteousness, right. as that language of imputation, I find, specifically goes a little bit beyond what Scripture does, hmm. um, so that we can maybe use language that's just a, a, a bit more exacting there. Right. So it's not a rejection entirely of, of, like, of kind of traditional Protestant ways of configuring these things. It's it's saying instead that there are ways in which we can get closer to scriptures on emphases. 
Got it. Got it. Well, I think that was a little more technical than what we're used to, but I think that's really good because it stretches us. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we do this is to help people wrestle and grow and be challenged and to think outside of the box. And I think that you've done that. Um, Again, I said said we'd go to application and the so what, but I do want to ask you one more question because uh, as we've talked about this, I know a question that people are going to wrestle with. And we, I think, talked about it maybe at the beginning or even offside or outside of the camera was, the, this tension between um, free grace and works, right? And I think there's going to be some people who hear this talk on allegiance and they're going to say, aha, there it is. It's salvation by grace and works. Can you dismiss that or can you clarify that for people listening or watching? Yeah, I think that there's um, oftentimes as part of that conversation an inadequate nuancing of grace and grace's right. complexity in the Bible. Um, and this is something I actually do more with in my follow-up book, um, Gospel Allegiance. Um, right. I have a chapter on grace where I, I kind of split grace apart into six dimensions. And, and in here, in doing so, I'm following the work quite closely of a, of a, a well-known scholar, um, John Barclay, and his mm-hmm. work, Paul and the Gift. Um, so Barclay um, shows, I think, convincingly that um, that we have talked past each other about grace, mm-hmm. um, that we have tended to assume that the meaning of grace is God's unmerited favor uh, that uh, has nothing to do with our earning or deserving. Mm-hmm. And on the one hand, there's some truth in that. On, on the other hand, there's um, there's some problems with um, with that construction. Mm-hmm. So Barclay splits grace into six different dimensions, and he says that, um, that Scripture um, s- supports some of those, um, but not all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what is tended to be emphasized then um, is, uh, especially in free gr- grace circles, mm-hmm. would be that grace is something that is unmerited, that we don't deserve. Uh, and so therefore, um, it's something that we can't, uh, that the, the response is irrelevant. Um, Barclay does some careful work to show that that wasn't the case in antiquity, uh, that um, the ideas of grace actually involved reciprocation. Mm-hmm. So that um, if a gift was given, you needed to repay the gift, gift back in order to keep the circle of gift giving oh, um, going forward. Um, so that grace demanded actually reciprocation. So that we shouldn't think that um, that because grace is unmerited, which is indeed true, that means that it doesn't require a behavioral response in return to the mm. gift. Right. Um, that's a misunderstanding of grace. And Paul understands both obedience and faith uh, to be proper responses to grace. And I think that he shows that. Um, and that if you don't actually give those back, if you don't give back your loyalty to Jesus, you've spurned the gift. Hmm. So that um, the gift is given with strings attached in antiquity. We don't deserve it, right. but the idea that it's given without strings attached is a wrong-headed idea that cannot be supported from Scripture or from antiquity. Well, is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, maybe a, a simplified example of, of that? Yeah, yeah, Ephesians two eight through ten, um, you know, is obviously a, a really important text, um, and I walk um, I walk readers through that text in the final chapter of um, the book Gospel Allegiance, partly because readers of Salvation by Allegiance alone um, raised questions, right? Um, and um, part of the, some of the questions they raised had to do with, well, how do we make sense of Ephesians two eight through ten? <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, so Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, in order that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in the Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, whenever we understand grace appropriately in context, um, Paul is um, emphasizing actually corporate grace, like he's emphasizing the gift God gave to the community, mm-hmm. which is probably the gospel itself. Um, we wouldn't want to separate it from the gift of the gospel itself. Um, whenever it's Paul says um, saved through faith, right? We tend to think of faith as being um, uh, definitely like our trust in the Lord Jesus and in the promises God has made through him. Hmm. Without excluding that possibility, um, we should also recognize that it might be talking about faithfulness uh, hmm. or our loyalty to Jesus. Right. Um, and then uh, when it talks about not by works, um, careful study of the term works suggests this has to do with works of law, 
Um, and that's Paul, probably an abbreviation by Paul. When he says works, he intends mm -hmm. works of law. We see other places where he abbreviates in that way. Um, and uh, that, that by that, Paul means especially kosher and circumcision and things like that. Right. So Paul is wanting to say that we're not saved by works of Torah. Um, and that uh, this boasting, right, that Paul is concerned about might have to do with ac ethnic privilege and having the law. Mm. Um, so uh, some some support for that would would come from what where Paul goes immediately after that in Ephesians as he talks about how um, God has uh, made us one in Christ. Mm. Right. Um, beyond um, this dividing wall of hostility and so forth. Right. Wow. Well, I, I do also recommend your book, uh, Gospel Allegiance. We didn't have time to talk about that book in particular today, but I thought you brought a lot of clarity to um, the, the, your other book. So l let's talk now about application. Uh, the, one of the things I will say often at the end of, of a message is, so what? So what? I mean, great. That, that's really great to, to hear God's word and to hear these principles, but so what? So my question is, if, if in fact that salvation or, or belief is is not the proper interpretation, but rather allegiance better defines what it looks like to truly believe in Christ, to be to be uh, to pledge allegiance to His kingship. So what? What difference does that make for us today as Christians? How then should we live, Matt? Yeah, well, certainly um, it fronts the need for an ongoing posture of loyalty to the King, right? That we shouldn't think that salvation. Um, with all due respect to my mother, right, involves <laughs> praying uh, to ask Jesus into my heart. Um, not that that can't be effective for our salvation. Many of us come to Christ in that way, but I think we all recognize that if it ends there, something has gone radically wrong. Hmm. Um, and I think it helps highlight the degree to which um, our our ongoing response to Jesus, right, of loyalty right. or allegiance, that this is not something that we have to earn. Like, um, we don't have to have perfect allegiance. Um, his allegiance has a primacy. He's won salvation for us, and we're integrated into his allegiance, mm -hmm. his faithfulness. Um, but at the same time, um, our allegiance has to be real, and that involves an embodiment from the ground up, right? We, our bodies are implicated. Right. So one of the things I think that it reminds us of is that we can't just be mind-only Christians, mm. right? That um, we can't just think like, okay, well, God is really just interested in my trust. He just wants mm -hmm. this mental posture from me. And if I have the right mental posture, then I'm then he's happy with me. Right. Uh, God is interested in the whole of me, and that involves an ongoing trajectory of allegiance in my life. But it's not going to be perfect. Um, and Jesus is the forgiving king. Uh, but right. nevertheless, he is the king, right? Yep. And we, we need to take that seriously. So I, I would say that's um, point number one would be like kind of an integration of discipleship and mm -hmm. um uh, into our understanding of salvation, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is consonant with everything Jesus teaches, right? That we need to take up our cross to follow him, yes. right? And that our salvation involves that. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that would be one thing I would say, like, why does it matter? Um, yeah. You know, and I, I think that also helps us to think through um, matters of allegiance more in practical ways in our life um, mm -hmm. as it helps us to deal with ethical frameworks. If we, right. um, if we realize like, okay, um, my highest loyalty goes to King Jesus, um, it helps us to uh, recognize that we can have legitimate like sub allegiances. Like that doesn't um, mean that I am not loyal to my wife or mm -hmm. that I'm not loyal to my boss, right. um, but it helps us to think through the ethics, uh, the ethical mm -hmm. boundaries of that, right? If my wife asked me to do something that was immoral, um, that would violate my allegiance to King Jesus, I would have to say no, even though I'm right. loyal to my wife. If my boss asked me to do something unethical, right, um, I would have to say no, loyalty to King Jesus trumps that. Uh, and I can't, I can't, uh, I can't do that. Hmm. So I think there's some practical payoff um, in, in terms of uh, just helping us think through um, what it means to live a life of faithfulness to King Jesus. Right. Yeah, and I think one of, one other thing would be potentially is how we convey the gospel to, to people and what it really means to be a follower of Christ. And that's one of the terms I use more than Christian. I think Christian has become such a watered-down, loosey-goosey term that it's like, well, I mean, we're all Christians, right? I mean, hey, have you seen my Facebook status? Uh, and, and I just don't think we, we, can, we can do that. So um, when we're conveying the gospel, we have to remember the, the total package, the total picture of the gospel. And I think you've done a really good job of laying that out. But I cannot agree more. Live your life as if 
Jesus Christ is king because guess what? He is king and we should live like it. Uh, my last question for you is this, and you actually alluded to it, and I'm glad you did. Um, you know, we do, I think, as Americans, specifically Americans, have a tension here, right? We pledge allegiance to the flag, right? We, we are, we're Americans and we're proud of it. And so there is a sense of allegiance. How, how does that play out? Because obviously as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, our allegiance is to Christ first and foremost, but yet we're patriotic. So how do those two work together? Do they? Can they? Yeah, um, there certainly is tension there. And I think um, we can have a healthy patriotism, I think, without that devolving into a more um, extreme nationalism. Yep. Um, there's nothing wrong with having pride of local place, pride of um, state place, pride of national place, right? There's nothing wrong with us thinking like, you know, as we come together as citizens, we do things well here in our community. Mm -hmm. um, like um, it becomes dangerous when we see other people as the challenger to that. Right. If it becomes like, no, we do things better here in our local town, Quincy, than they do over there in Peoria, Illinois, mm -hmm. like or in Lincoln, Nebraska. Right. If our if no, the way we do things in Quincy. Right. We're the best. And those people are challengers to our our mm -hmm. bestness. Right. Mm -hmm. um, then then it, then we're in trouble. And I think that especially happens on the national level. Right. If we see other nations as challenger. Um, rather than seeing God's blessing as enough for the world, right? Mm -hmm. God creates the world good. Yep. And um, I think that part of the message of this, of the transnational um, nature of Christianity is that Jesus is summoning the, the allegiant obedience of the nations, mm -hmm. right? And um, that we can't see other nations as a challenger um, to, um, to take the good from us. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to become convinced that God's earth right, has enough goodness for everybody if we live cross-shaped lives. Hmm. Um, if we're not convinced of that, we're going to hoard, we're going to grab, we're going to do, um, we may make national decisions that don't reflect the true nature of our allegiance to Jesus the King. Hmm. And that's where I see the danger of uh, a kind of a healthy patriotism beginning to kind of slip over into a um, problematic nationalism. Right. Right. Well, I, we always got to remind ourselves, Colossians 1, that, you know, Christ is supposed to be eminent, right? First place in our lives. And that's from that, everything else flows. And if we can do that, we'll be off to a good start. Well, Matt, I, I cannot thank you enough for your time. Uh, if, if you're listening or watching today and you're like, oh, I got to know more, I want to know more, I'm telling you, you should know more and you got to pick up uh, Matt's books. So where do they go to pick up your books and where do they go to learn more about you and what you're doing? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I have a website. It's um, www.matthewwbates.com, I think. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can find links to the books there. Um, obviously, you can go to um, any kind of, um, you know, nationally oriented book retailer, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatnot, and you'll be able to find um, copies of Salvation by Allegiance Alone or Gospel Allegiance or the other couple of books I've written. Um, but um, yeah, uh, those those books are both actually by the same press under a different imprint. Uh, so Baker Academic is the publisher for Salvation by Allegiance Alone, mm -hmm. and Brazos is the uh, the publisher for um, Gospel Allegiance. It's actually the same publisher. It's all part of the Baker family. They just have different imprints. Um, so uh, yeah, that's where you can go uh, to to discover more. Um, I also have a, 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 a podcast called On Script. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, oriented toward um, like academic biblical scholarship and theology. Mm -hmm. We mostly interview professional theologians uh, and professional Bible scholars. Um, and so that's a if that's the kind of conversation you're interested in and in doing more of, uh, you could check out that podcast as well as um, this one. And I would highly encourage you to do so. You're also on social media, and I see that we're now following each other. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, so we can interact more. Yeah. But uh, again, highly encourage you, uh, go to his website. Sure, yeah. Pick Connect up his with books. me, Twitter, yeah. Facebook. Yeah, but whatever. Do it. Do it. And I, I tell you, you may not agree with everything he says, but I think you're going to be challenged and you will grow. And I think you're going to have a whole new appreciation for King Jesus. And I know that's what Matt would want from you as well. Well, Matt, Matt uh, thank you so much for your time today. And I hope we connect again soon. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for listening to the Hard Questions, Real Answers podcast. To learn more about our podcast, be sure you check out backtothebible.org. Also, if you enjoy our program, be sure to give us a rating and share us if you like us on your favorite podcasting app. Remember, ask the hard questions and only accept real answers. <laughs>